um, we're just going to get started. So um, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kenneth, and I'm just going to turn it over to him so he can give you all the, the benefit of all of his um, wonderful expertise. Uh, so Kenneth is an assistant public defender with the Harris County Public Defender's Office in Houston, Texas. Kenneth is also a member of the training committee at the Public Defender's Office and frequently gives presentations both inside and outside of his office. Before joining the Public Defender's Office a year ago, Kenneth was a supervising attorney at the Orleans Public Defender's Office in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he practiced uh, for the last eight and a half years prior to moving to Houston. Um, being born and raised in Louisiana, he received his undergraduate degree from Louisiana State University before graduating law school from Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Kenneth has handled and tried several cases over the past nine years, several hundred cases, excuse me, over the past nine years, um, including but not limited to drug, burglary, robbery, um, murder, and rape cases. Over the last six years, Kenneth has shifted his focus on increasing community awareness regarding the negative implications of mass incarceration and was featured on BET's The DA versus Black America, as well as on 60 Minutes with Anderson Cooper, discussing the impact of underfunded public defenders offices. Kenneth also co-hosted a full day seminar for the NFL and New Orleans Saints on oppression in the criminal justice system and the challenges that public defenders have in changing the narrative. In addition to being licensed in Texas, Kenneth is also licensed to practice law in Louisiana and the Eastern District of Louisiana. Kenneth is recurring faculty for the Harvard Trial Advocacy Program, the Alan Ray Boland Trial Advocacy Workshop, and Gideon's Promise. Outside of his faculty roles, Kenneth is a board member for Gideon's Promise, a graduate of the National Criminal Defense College, a graduate of the Louisiana Defender Training Institute, and a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. In August of last year, Kenneth was the recipient of the 2019 Stephen B. Bright Public Defender Award, which is a national award given annually in recognition of attorneys on their contribution to improving the quality of indigent defense. So with all of that, um, it's clear that Kenneth has so much experience and um, Kenneth, I am very grateful and appreciative that you are giving your time today um, to uh, basically teach us all uh, more about cross-examination, which is something that I think we can always improve on. So uh, Kenneth, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very appreciative uh, to be trusted to give this type, uh, to give any presentations, the presentation that was two weeks ago or this presentation. I've given both presentations a, a few times, but uh, I do consider it a blessing uh, to do that uh, because this is a skill, this is an art that we do. And there are a lot of people that depend uh, us, that depend on us for perfecting that art. Uh, a lot of times, and no offense to anyone who isn't uh, religious or spiritual, but we are the answer to someone's prayer. And so it's, uh, it's prudent upon us to do our best, to be our best. Uh, that being said, I, I don't want to begin uh, without uh, hoping and wishing that everyone is, is well, physically, mentally, and emotionally during these unprecedented times. So my intention over the next hour and a half is to hopefully inspire you, enlighten you, um, and, and do the best that I can to make these times a little bit better. So uh, I often say, uh, I often say, I said this last week, uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I spoke to uh, some of you, if you were there, about client relationships uh, and, and, and empowering clients to keep them on the same page with us. It was more of a value-based training. This uh, week, we are going to talk about more of a skill-based training and particularly the skill that we are going to be focused on is the most advertised broadcast, broadcast skill there is, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a lay person, no matter where you are, everyone knows what cross-examination is. Are they love to see it or they love to do it? Sometimes both. Uh, so that being said, that's what we're going to discuss and more particularly storytelling through cross-examination. Um, so before I begin, and now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, for those of you that are trying to get in, um, I may be delayed in letting you in simply because now I'm in share screen mode. Uh, so forgive me if, I'm, I'm, if you're delayed uh, in getting in. Uh, but storytelling through cross-examination. Uh, that is what we're going to be talking about today. And I often say, I know how these CLEs are, uh, or these, uh, these presentations are, and we are several months into the pandemic, 
So many of you are probably vacuuming at the same time, running around doing other things. We're long past the time where we're a little focused on the screen. So I say this, uh, be prepared, because sometimes I use a lot of imagery, I use a lot of graphics. You never know what's going to show up next. You may even see a picture of yourself. So for nothing else, if you want to tune in for that, uh, at least hopefully you can find that part interesting. So uh, alas, storytelling through examination. A lot of people, when you hear the word storytelling, they think of opening statements, they think of closing statements. And while that is true, storytelling is a feature that we use in those particular skills within trial. We're not limited to to use of storytelling through trial. Uh, in fact, you know, you can still tell a story uh, with a dialogue. It doesn't have to be a monologue, right? As opening statements and closing statements are. You can still use a dialogue to tell stories. And the challenge is, I know some of you may be thinking, well, ooh, that's challenging because you never you, you can't guarantee what someone's going to say on their return. Uh, on their dialogue and, and coming back to you. And that is true sometimes, and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, but more importantly, I would like you to walk away with three objectives at the conclusion of this presentation. The first one is, we're gonna discuss the importance of developing character themes uh, within the defense theory. Uh, the second uh, that we're going to do is we're gonna discuss the impact of various persuasive um, techniques that enhance the storytelling feature of cross-examination. And finally, we're gonna discuss the big picture of how the use of persuasive techniques fall within the jury's assess assessment of credibility. So, my clicker is working. If it is not so, we're gonna go old school with it. So, in beginning, why am I using the word storytelling? Why am I using the word storytelling? Uh, you know, this graphic kind of says it all uh, because juries love stories. It's everything that we do when you think about it, especially during a pandemic. This is the one thing that never goes away, no matter how advanced technology goes. Everyone loves a story. It's why you go to the movies or Netflix or, or, or any other device that you use to stream movies or old school cable now, which is now old school. We love stories. Juries are no different. You have a bunch of people coming into the room and they're listening to a bunch of lawyers stand and talk most of the day, sometime for several days. So when you frame it in a story, that is what it makes interesting. That's what grabs their attention. Uh, looking at some jury, I don't know if some of you are familiar with jury surveys and jury assessments, which became really popular around the OJ time, which I'm going to refer to a lot throughout this presentation. Um, they did a lot of jury polls and jury assessments, which go on to this day. Some interesting statistics from some of the more recent. Uh, recent jury polls. Jurors forget 60% of what they say, uh, of, of what they hear, right? Uh, they 83% think of terms of images. And, and the most important thing that we're going to sit around is this bottom statistic here. 90% of human reactions are based on emotions. And it's kind of like the saying goes, uh, people will forget what you say. Sometimes they forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. That is no more true outside the courtroom than it is inside the courtroom. It is true in all stages of life because this is another form of communication. And sometimes we're so focused on the skill set that we forget the essence of communicating and what we're doing. So one thing I would like to for you to hone in on is this question. Are we at a disadvantage? Are we at a disadvantage? I would say we are. Because think about this, law school. Whenever you go to law school, we're trained to think like lawyers. That's what you do. Think about who you communicate to with lawyers. You are studying to become a lawyer. You're communicating to professors who are lawyers, right? Um, and that is your everyday surrounding, right? And your goal is to become a lawyer. So you talk, think, speak like a lawyer. Now, I am not selling short the beauty of that and the importance of that. But whenever you are taking that long transition and going to the courtroom, more times you are going to be speaking to people who are not lawyers because the people who are jurors that are lawyers will probably be struck for calls or at the very least, uh, they will have periphery strikes, right? For, uh, strikes for whatever the case may be. So more often than not, the jury panel is going to be lawyers. So you're taking this whole several years of whatever you've been doing leading up to where you are now, right? And now you're speaking to a bunch of folks 
that have nothing to do with what you have spent years perfecting and learning and going to NCDC and Gideon's Promise and Jerry Spence and all these other things to do, right? So I think we're at a disadvantage because we're stuck in lawyer communication. And then you have your office, right? Many of you, um, if you work in public defense offices like mine, uh, you know, in New Orleans and in Houston, uh, we have a, a very strong culture of public defense. We have a very unique sense of humor in discussing cases. Uh, and, but that's what you do. You go, to your, you go from office to office and you, you, sit, you sit at the doorway and you discuss this case. Let me talk to you about a case. And you're talking to more lawyers, right? And then you have your personal life. You probably take it home to a spouse, to a friend, to a relative. And you're talking about a case, right? Or you're talking about your feelings about something that happened in the courtroom. We're doing it every day. And the problem is when you take all that lawyer speak and, and, and this is what you have with a jury. This is what you have with a jury when they're hearing this. You know, yes, there's, there is several exculpatory, there's, there's so much exculpatory information in the light of the state's inculpatory information that pursuant to Brady, we're gonna make sure and bring out all the favorable evidence in this case because they cannot prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, that sounds all great. But the jury will be looking like this. It sounds like want, 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 want. You're becoming exactly what they expect you to be. Either boring or on the opposite side, one of those TV lawyers that use a bunch of words that rhyme. And, and so that is, you want to you wanna stay away from boxing yourself in whenever you're speaking to a jury. So the first time is to recognize it. We are at a disadvantage in our communication with a jury. We're at a disadvantage. So let's talk about how we become, how we get out of that disadvantage. Character things, emotional things, right? That's why storytelling is important. And the way we storytell is that we develop these emotional things that appeal to our jury, right? That establishes a connect, that, that establish a commonality between this jury. Now, that's why I know this training is not on jury selection or better yet jury deselection, but you want to be very, very, very cognizant of picking the right jury because if we're developing emotional steam, steam, uh, themes to establish a commonality, between us and our jury, you want to be very, very cautious about experiences that folks may have that may make them uh, not be able to, that, that may make it difficult for them to separate their emotions. For example, if your house was robbed last week, then maybe for this case, robbery, uh, you know, a charge about burglary is not a good case for this juror, right? So you want to be very common about that. You don't want a situation like this. You know, with all due respect to Michael Vick, who I think is one of the, the greatest uh, quarterbacks to ever touch the football field, for those of you that are football fans, you don't want a jury that maybe their dog, someone, you have three or four people where their animal passed away. Now, I'm not assuming, now I'm not saying that to assume that Michael Vick is guilty or at the time he's guilty or whatever the case may be, but they have a certain, certain sensitivity to the allegations that's going to make it very difficult for them to separate uh, their sensitivity to it as opposed to listening to the facts within a neutral light before making a determination. You don't want a situation like this. And that's what the picture is meant to demonstrate. So when we're talking about that commonality and getting the right jurors, that sets the foundation for whenever you advance into these emotional things. So from the very basics, right? After a jury is selected, you know what, you know what a, tr a trial is about, right? It's about two competing narratives. You have the prosecution's narrative, right? This is how they want your client to see, be, to be. This is the image that they want everyone to see. This man that's not smiling, this man that looks exactly like the, what he's accused of. But as you know, we represent the person, not the crime. So what we want to show is the narrative of this, right? Now, this is all beyond my time because I'm an 80s baby, right? But I do know the stories that's be, that preceded me. And that is of OJ the Heisman. OJ Hertz commercial, right? We all know that OJ, juice as they like to call him. That is the narrative that we want to advance, right? And that, and a lot of, and, and again, I said it before, this is not just within opening statements. We want to start it in opening statements and we want to carry it through, right? So you want to get this image of how you want your client to depict. So when you talk, when you're talking about character things, start with your client. So understanding the prosecution story of Gill is really, really easy. This is the easy part. We know, what their, we know what their four points are. And no matter what jurisdiction you, you're in, whether it's Orleans Parish, whether it's Harris County, Houston, or whether it's Prince William County, we all know, right? Is the defendant did it, the witnesses are credible, right? Police, they investigated the case, but if you don't do anything about it, they're gonna get you next, right? So it's very, very easy to figure out what the prosecution story of guilt is. 
It's a little bit more challenging to determine ours. So let's talk about cross-examination and what good cross-examination is. Those of you may be yawning by now because you all know what it is. But just for a recap, we're going to discuss what good cross-examination is, technique, right? One fact per question, right? We know one fact per question because we want it clear for the record. You're wearing a shirt. That shirt was blue. That shirt that was blue had a flower on it, right? You want to make sure one fact per question. One, because it draws out a clear image of what this person was wearing just with the shirts, right? And if you're wearing clothes, you obviously want to use those transitions. I want to talk to you first about what you were wearing above your waist, right? So you want to use those kinds of things to establish that. One fact per question. It's also great for the record for appellate review as well right, or for impeachment. The second is leading questions. You definitely do not want to leave any room for error. You want to make sure that you're not asking those open-ended questions. So what did you do when you got to the scene? And then you're establishing these long narrative of answers that you may get something that you don't want to do or you cannot clean up. So you want to make sure that you are in control, right? Whenever you are doing direct examination, it's all about the witness. Right? Everything, the spotlight is on the witness, but whenever you're doing cross, the spotlight is on you. You are the storyteller. So leading questions. And you want to make sure to ask questions that advance your theory. Right? That's why your theory is the controlling factor within the case. And what do I mean by advancing your theory? Well, if you have a question where you're using misidentification, misidentification is your genre, right? Don't focus so much on alibi so much, right? Because if misidentification is what you're focused on, you don't have to necessarily say, oh, well, in addition to that, let me explain uh, where he was. Because if you, because then now you shifted the jury's focus. If you don't explain the exact time, the exact moment that they weren't there, they're not focusing on the misidentification. They're not focusing on the witness's uh, inaccuracy. They're focusing on where your client was. And I know because I had an issue like that where I almost lost a trial. We end up winning, but we almost lost a trial because we're so focused on, hey, you know what? Not only does he not look like the guy, but he was here. Right? That's a reason why jurisdictions have 10-day alibi rules. That's why they distinguish it within the code. Some of you may have, may be, you may be in your, your jurisdiction may have that, where you have to file for an alibi at a time, right? Because it's not assumed that that's going to be part of a misidentification. So you want to make sure, and actually, it may be a good fact, right? The fact that they were somewhere else, but does it advance your theory, right? So you want to be very, very cautious about that. Now, the reason why I wanted to outline good cross-examination, because we don't want to be just good. What we want is that we want to be great, right? We want to be great. We want to be better than good. So when I say that this presentation is about um, storytelling through cross-examination, this is very much in it. This is meant to be uh, advanced cross-examination. This is meant to be a skill, a building skill. But you can't build without knowing the basis. So when we talk about cross-examination, the challenge is, is that we're not telling the, the story of innocence from our witnesses. Some of you may have had many of your trials. You don't even have witnesses, right? The challenge is we're telling our story of innocence through the prosecution's witnesses, right? Through the prosecution's witnesses. That's what makes it more challenging. But uh, that's where the persuasive piece comes in. That's where knowing and building an image comes in. But when we're talking about cross-examination, that's why the important defense themes is also essential. You want to make juries walk away with a feeling about the state's witness. Your witnesses too, but you want to make sure that they feel something about your jury. And the only way you know that is to establish the feelings as an objective for this witness, right? And again, you want to connect to them on a human level. So you're hearing this, right? Oh, I, I hear you, Ken. If you're talking about this theory, this theme, this theme, I hear you. I hear you. Well, repetition, you know, I'm going to be repeating it. I'm going to repeat it throughout this presentation. But before we do that, how do we do that, right? Where do you start? Obviously, you start with your theory. You start with your theory. Uh, and you start with who are the characters in your theory, right? Who are the people? Literally, list them out. Start with your client, police officer. I know it sounds very elementary, but you break it down piece by piece because it's that important, right? This is a big formula that we're going to build to. But first, you start with these basic questions. And how do you want the jury to feel about each character in your theory? Now, this third question I want to focus on, uh, the how do I want the jury to feel about each character in my theory. Uh, in teaching many trainings, uh, a lot of times I've explained to many trainings within a training. Um, this is what I tell younger attorneys. Think of three 
emotions that you want your jury to feel about the witness after they take the stand. Your goal is to examine, your cross-examination is to make that jury feel that way. So a lot of times, whenever you're practicing, let's say you start your cross, now I write out every cross, uh, I don't care how long I've been doing it, and unfortunately there is one thing I wanna correct, I haven't done hundreds of trials, but I've done several. Um, and one thing I can say about cross is that I still write them out. That's a me thing. Now, do I read them? Absolutely not. But I write them out. I write them out so as a confidence. It's a confidence booster that I know it's there, right? I know it's there. And then there's a lot of ways if I know it that well, I don't need to depend upon it. So I do write them out. But in addition to that, I, make an, I, keep myself, I write them out to keep myself accountable to making sure that I've accomplished the motion that I want. So whenever you're talking about your cross-examination and doing it, consider whenever you're talking with your colleagues or maybe someone that's not a better yet, probably someone that has nothing to do with law. Ask them after they finish their cross, how do you feel about this jury? You know, what, what, what are three adjectives that come to mind after you finish your chapters across, right? And that is a good thing to do. In fact, that might be part of your chapter headings. I do believe in the chapter method. That may be part of your chapter headings. If you haven't accomplished that emotion, then you may need to get more detailed with your cross. You may need to get more specific with your cross. That is a good way, I believe, is a good starting point to making sure you bring that emotion into those witnesses. So what is the thing? So when I ask about those three adjectives per witness, what is your character thing? First things first is the theory of your case, though. You can't develop a character thing without a, uh, without a theory. You can't develop without a theory. Uh, and because here's the thing. You need your theory from the very beginning, and it needs to be very, very, it may needs to be known, and it needs to be clear, right? Because jurors will do this. They may not do it, they may not do it physically, but mentally, they're already there. And sometimes emotionally, they're already there. So you can't wait till closing argument to start the theory. You can't wait till cross-examination to start your theory. This theory has to be there from the very, very beginning. And when, when we talk about theory, what do I mean, right? What do I mean? And one thing, one stat that I kind of skipped over, 80, 90% of jurors determine how they're going to feel about opening statements. If they're making their first decision, now a lot of times I know they go back and forth like a tennis match, right, over their decisions. But if they're making their first determination by opening statements, then if your theory isn't clear, that's a very dangerous, that's a dangerous boat to be on, paddling through these waters. Very, very dangerous boat to be on. And when I say being clear with your theory, I like to think of your theory as this. Now, everybody goes, I, I know that there are many different definitions of theory because some of you, there may be one or two of you out there saying, well, Kenneth, what is a theory, right? Uh, uh, Self-defense is not a theory. Misidentification is not a theory. Fabrication is not a theory. Those are defense genres, not theories. Theories are three to four sentences that explain why your client did not do whatever, they, why they're not guilty, right? why they're not guilty. And I think of a theory, three components of a theory. Now this is, and the reason why there's not a slide dedicated to this is because this is not theory in it. Brainstorming and why storming theories is a training in itself, right? And there, and I have done presentations on, on theories, but I, 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 will feel, I will feel really badly if I didn't mention this. Within those three to four sentences, there are three components uh, within a theory as far as how I like to think of it. One is a legal component. That is where your misidentification or your self-defense comes in, your legal component. The other is the factual component. What are your facts that are leading you towards establishing that? And the third is an emotional component. Voila, what we're discussing. Three to four sentences that capture the, that, that within that formula that captures why your client didn't do it, right? And the reason why I say three to four sentences is because if you have these long theories, then you make it too complicated. It's too complicated. And if you can't articulate why your client is not guilty in three to four sentences, then your jury is going to look like that. Your jury needs to, your, your theory needs to be clear. That's why these theories, that's why it's important when you get a case from arrest to start working on it. These theories, it takes a while to develop that. I don't care how good we think we are. It takes a while to develop a theory, but it's important because you can't establish any of this, what I'm talking about without it. Nothing what I'm going to say moving forward makes no sense without a theory. So cross-examination. Theory of defense should be incorporated in every phase of the trial. We just discussed that. Best cross-examination, jury knows your theory and theme and have a theme for every witness. And by the way, this picture 
uh, I had to post this picture. It's a Gideon's Promise picture. Back then, they, were, they weren't known as Gideon's Promise. They were known as SPDPC, Southern Public Defender Training Center. Um, I, I'm giving how old I am within Gideon's Promise, but nonetheless, it's a very, that was my class that we were in. So shout out to if, for those of you that are part of Gideon's this class of 2012. Uh, but, but making it clear, what to think, making it clear what you want the jury to believe about each and prosecute case. So now we're going to discuss a hypothetical. Uh, there's nothing better than a hypothetical to hammer these things down, our objectives down. So I have crafted uh, a, a hypothetical that we're going to use for the purposes of this presentation to demonstrate exactly what we're talking about when we're saying good, good cross versus great cross, character things. So consider this armed robbery hypothetical, right? This is the setting. Uh, the charged armed robbery with the firearm, the location is in an alley next to a CC's coffee shop located on Magazine Street in New Orleans. And bear with me because I happen to be in New Orleans right now. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, so I, I, I come back to driving now. I can't really fly. I'm not comfortable flying. But uh, I'm in New Orleans right now uh, doing this presentation. So I crafted the hypothetical from New Orleans. And the setting is trial, right? Your complaining witness is on the stand. And uh, this is direct. This is the direct examination. The typical prosecutor question. Please take us through that moment when you turned around and saw the gun in your face, right? Or what happened, right? By the way, I will say as a side note, we all know that that question is objectionable because it calls for a narrative. But nonetheless, for purposes of this presentation, we're focusing on the cross, not objections, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and read it out. Um, this is the witness. I was heading to CC's coffee shop to prepare for a presentation to public defenders in Prince William County the following week, scheduled for the, well, scheduled for the following week, excuse the typo. I live about four blocks away, so I usually walk there. The shop is at the corner of Magazine Street, which you know is always congested. So I usually put my earbuds in and take the alley to avoid tourists crowding the walkway and bike riders. That night, I got to the middle of the alley and heard someone shout over my music. I turned around and I saw a guy in a black hoodie pointing a gun at me, asking me for my purse. It happened so fast and all I could think about was my six-year-old daughter and whether I would see her again. He kept yelling, but I froze. Even with a breeze, I was sweating because of how bad my nerves were. The gun seemed to get bigger and bigger. I wondered if I would live to see another day. It was silver and the handle was black. I couldn't keep my eyes off the finger of his glove nuzzling the trigger. It was the scariest moment of my life and what that man pointing at the defense table did forever changed me. I go to this coffee shop every week, take the same alley to get there every time I go. I'm born and raised here, but I will never feel the same about a place that used to be so special to me. Now, that is a handful, but I'm sure for those of you that have been practicing more than five years or so, you've probably experienced a narrative like this. You've either A, experienced a complainant that has given out these facts throughout the length of a direct examination, or B, you may have experienced a narrative similar to this. It makes you feel some kind of way, doesn't it? It makes the complaining witness, you even, we're, look, we're human beings, right? I'm not asking you to ignore the fact that we feel sorry for this woman, assuming that this fact happened. If we know, that, right, for this, this fact pattern assumes the fact beyond change is that this woman was robbed, right? We're not negating that she wasn't robbed. So that being said, given that this is a fact beyond change, we feel badly for this woman. Right? So how do I get up after this woman just told this? And maybe she used tears and she broke down. What do I do now? Well, first thing is we don't neglect our basis. We use proper form. We, you know, that's the leading questions, one fact per question that we talked about, advancing a theory. We ask questions that lock in impeachment, right? We lock in impeachment for the stuff that we know, right? Um, and make sure we know our sources, right? Whether your source is a police report, an investigative statement, a transcript, whatever it is that we have. I, and I like to cite those sources within my cross-examination so I know where to go back to. Um, and it makes your notes more organized. For those of you that use a trial folder or a trial notebook, whatever you use, it's organized. You definitely want to be organized. You don't want to be scrolling through like, oh my God, let me see. Makes you look very, very, very unprofessional, untrustworthy, and jurors are watching you. But one thing I absolutely can't stand is repeating the direct. There's no need to repeat the direct unless you're trying to emphasize a point. 
right? Unless you're trying to emphasize a point or you're starting the first step in, 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 in impeachment, right? You're committing the witness to what they said. You know, uh, on direct, you said, right? If you're, if, unless you're just starting an impeachment or you're trying to emphasize a point, don't get up there and just repeat the direct. It, it, it just, first of all, you're born the jury. Like we've heard this, right? So you want to make sure if you're going to get up there and you're going to repeat the direct, which is usually a bad fact, you better have a reason for it. So don't forget cr good cross-examination as far as following a complaining witness like this. But first things first is a case theory. Now we talked about what a theory is. For purposes of this hypothetical, I'm just gonna give you an example of a, pro of a theory, given that this presentation isn't about theory development. Client never robbed complaining witness because he was not there that night. Client was mistakenly pointed out not only by a woman who had no way of seeing her accuser, but who was also terrified and overwhelmed in the moment of her trauma, and as a result of lazy and police, sloppy police investigation, the wrong man remained the only suspect, right? So you wanna have your legal component, right? You wanna have your factual, your facts that go towards that, and you want to have your emotion. And a lot of times within a theory, I know you may say, well, how can I capture emotions just with three to four sentences or whatever the case may be? Well, colorful language, colorful language, right? Not scared, terrified. Right, you want to use certain things. And while you may say terrify goes towards validating the complaining witness, well, maybe we want to validate it because we're getting to the point of leading to misidentification. So think about things that you normally would think are bad that actually may be good. So keep that in mind. So let's give an example. Because I, now normally, uh, we would love to just uh, moot cross-examination and I would just do this on my feet. But because we're in this space with Zoom, I'm just going to, uh, I wrote out a cross-examination. And if it's okay with you, I'm just going to read it out, even though I know you can see it. But those of you may be working with different screens or just listening to my voice. Um, let's look at what a cross-examination may look like, right? This happened at night. Fair to say it was dark. This also happened in an alley, which was away from the main streets. You saw a man with a gun. The man with the gun had a hoodie on, a black hoodie. The man with the gun pointed it directly at you. You were, at, you were looking at the gun as it was pointed at you. You were overwhelmed, you were terrified. Now, how many of you feel like this is a good cross-examination? I know that you can't really respond. So I'm gonna assume that some of you may say yes, some of you may say no. Does it have one fact per question? Yes. Are they leading questions? Yes. Do they advance a theory? More or less, yes. They even use repetition. The man with the gun, the man with the gun, right? He's not saying, you're not saying your client, the defendant, right? The man with the gun, the man with the gun. Repetition is a beautiful way. Whenever you have a label of a, uh, when you have a label of your character, use consistent labels. So it even uses that, but yet we walk away like this. How many of you have ever been in trial where you have your cross-examination and it's quick and it's fast and you sit down next to your co-counsel and you're like, I did that, right? Because you feel happy, you feel like you got all your points. And so you're like, man, this is good. Witness didn't fight me, I got everything I need. Ooh, we're going to close a statement and this is gonna be great. But the jury felt like this, right? The jury didn't fill in any of these points. You got your points, but guess what? To a room of lawyers, you got your point. Your public defenders in your office or your court appointed attorneys may be clapping for you and saying, good job. And I'm not underestimating the value of support from your coworkers. But to this, you're, it, this, this doesn't mean jack to your jury. Your jury doesn't know that you got a point, right? You went through fast, you went through monotone and you're kind of like, you got your points, that's great. And you may have something built for a cross-examination, but they didn't feel anything in this moment. I promise you they did. So how do we change that? Well, what, let's start with what's missing. It was dark, you were looking at a gun, you were terrified, you were overwhelmed, right? Conclusive questions, conclusive questions. Each of these could be a chapter on its own. It was dark, but what is dark? That's such a subjective term, right? Have you went out to the scene and seen the investigation yourself to know what dark looks like at this time of the night? Looking at a gun, how many guns are there, right? What kind of gun? How big was the gun? You know what? Better yet, how much description did they give the gun? Because if they gave, it, they gave an awesome description, then maybe they were looking at the gun rather than the person holding it, right? Terrified, overwhelmed. That's great. But, hmm, 
right? It's like meh. It doesn't really get you anywhere. You lose emotional connection with the jury, right? That's what the problem with conclusive question is. That's, that's the thing. You lose the emotional connection. Witness, now don't forget this, right? Witnesses care about how they look too. Many times we automatically assume that someone was robbed. And this is a fact beyond change, right? Someone was robbed, we assume that they're scared and that they're, that they're brave getting on the witness stand. Some witnesses care to the fact where um, they may want to seem like the hero of their story. Well, actually, I wasn't scared. I take Taekwondo, and so I wanted to make sure and let them know, I'm not, not me today. You picked the wrong one today, right? <laughs> you may get that person too. So you want to make sure you know a lot about your witness because they care about how they look. They don't want to be portrayed badly, right? Whether you portray them as lying, whether you portray them as scared, where, no matter how you're going to portray them, you want to be very cautious about every complaining witness or every witness, right, to know that. So do your homework. Kenneth, I, I actually uh, have two questions based on what we're talking about with this sure. hypothetical. One question, um, you mentioned, you know, the person's looking at the gun and are you going to ask them, you know, what type of gun is it? Some people might know the difference in types of guns, like I, I would probably know um, generally, and some people may have no idea. Um, sure. So is this, you know, is this the type of question where you're going to know, likely know the answer before you ask the question? I mean, is this something that something that's going to be in the police report that the witness told them? Because you don't want, I would guess you wouldn't want to be in a situation where you have no idea what they're going to say. And it turns out they're, well, I, I guess where I'm kind of going is this could go two ways. They could know exactly what type of gun it is. And then they were so focused on the gun you know, were they focused on the face of the person or right. if they weren't focused on the gun, maybe they were more focused on the actual person if they said, you know, I didn't pay attention to the gun, I paid attention to the man that was pointing it at me. Right. Um, we're going to address the, we're going to address that in another, in another cross down um, in a few slides, but I will answer this. Uh, a lot of times when you're talking about the gun, I usually like to make sure that one of the tasks that I do on the case is file a motion to inspect evidence. I come from jurisdictions to where we don't get access to the evidence. We have to file a motion that has to be granted by the court. So when I'm filing these initial discovery motions, that's one of the motions I'm filing from the onset. Because when I was in New Orleans, it took several weeks. I can get the motion granted, but you, you may not actually see the evidence until like a month, a month or two down the line. So that's usually the first motions I file right, because you'll have the item number, report number, some basic thing where they can identify it and include that so you can get access to that. The other thing is, looking off the report, first you're going to establish whether you're going to acknowledge the report as a credible source or you're going to break down the report as far as saying, nah, none of that happened. So first you're making those choices, assuming that you're accepting that at least that's a fact beyond change, that it was a Smith & Weston gun, then part of your investigation, whether it's through an investigator or through your own research, is looking up the types of guns, right? You're looking on the description or you're taking advantage of the lack of the description, right, about that. So depending on where you want to go. So those are different things that you want to make sure of. So when you're asking these leading questions, you already know the answer to. So in a way, yes, you are trying to out-educate the witness on this particular issue. This is one of those lines where it's intended that you know the answer, right? Uh, so this is not one of those guessing kind of things. You kind of know the answer. Or it's one of those things to where it's not that significant and they're saying it was a Smith & Wesson. No, it was blah, blah, blah. Okay, it was a, you know, more and more of like the purchase on the right stripe, right, left side of the shoulder and left side of the shoulder. You got to establish whether that's an important fact or not, mm -hmm. depending on how you approach it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. No, no problem. Um, so witnesses, I'm glad that, that that was brought up because the bigger overarching fact is for whether it's a gun, regardless of what the conversation piece is, witnesses care about how they look. You may get the answer that you don't expect. I'll show you a clip. Last, the two weeks ago, the clip didn't work. So I'm gonna see if this clip works. If it doesn't, I'll describe to you what it is. Can y'all see it? Um, I, Kenneth, I can see it, but I can't hear it. Okay, so y'all can see it, but can't hear it. No. Okay. What I'm going to do is just go ahead and describe the dialogue uh, as to what happened here. So this is a scene, uh, this is a scene uh, from one of our favorite TV shows, for those of you who may have watched The Wire, right? 
uh, where the gentleman is on the stand and he is cross, well, he's trying to cross examine him and he's going into this long narrative. You are a drug dealer, you are in the streets, you're doing this, you're doing that. He's going hard at him. And, and then finally the witness breaks up and says, just like you, man. And he says, excuse me. And he was like, well, he's like, you're saying I got the shotgun. He's like, you caught the briefcase. What's the difference? Right. And then all of a sudden, now the point is, is look how he shifted the narrative of perspective to where you're not even concerned about whether Omar is carrying guns or are doing drugs. You're not even concerned about that. You're concerned about who is really the enemy here. Maybe they're doing this illegal activity because the government has put them in a position of desperation where they have to. And all of a sudden, Omar made himself an, uh, a hero by that. And the judge can't do anything about it. That over-aggressive, what I call TV lawyering, going in, going in, going in, that's a result of not knowing, you're getting, you know, that not trying to do your homework when you're witness. Two, you are using these long, uh, now the problem with, uh, now this guy was not using open-ended questions, but he was using what I like to call compound questions, putting a lot of facts into to one question. When you're doing that, that's part of the danger of that. You'll get the answer you don't expect. So the point is, is that you want to make sure that you're not asking vague questions, compound questions, and that's what's missing from the first cross, because that first cross may not have done that, but it did ask vague questions, dark, all the other stuff, right? Because that witness can flip it around, even if you're using solid technique. That's what this clip was meant to show. So you want to move away on that vein. You want to move away from the look good cross. And basically, don't be afraid to step out of uh, step out of the boundaries, right? Don't limit yourself to just the inconsistent, wonderful impeachment stories. Because some of us, we just love to impeach. Only impeach when it's necessary. If they give you the answer, why are you still going down the steps of impeachment? They just gave you the answer. The impeachment over. You're making it about you, right? I understand to speak at a cross major a performance, but Think of it as the trial of this person sitting next to you's life. It becomes less of a performance whenever you're thinking about that. It's a technique, right? It's a technique and there is a difference. So don't get up there and make it be all about you. Prior record, delayed, but the lack of physical lack of physical evidence is great. Then you sound defensive rather than innocent, right? Many times, yes, the state does have a burden, but lack of physical evidence, the lack of this, and that's great. But make sure it's building towards a character theme of characterizing a police officer collecting that, right? With the lack of physical evidence without a theme is nothing more than defensive. Well, you can't prove it. Maybe my client did do it, but you can't prove it. Many jurors will convict him based on the fact that, well, maybe he did other stuff in other trials and other cases, so we're going to get him on this, even though they can't prove it, right? They're gonna, you're going to make the jury empower them to feel like they have to be the Batman and punish them for unpunished stuff that they may not even know about. So that's the problem, that's the risk of saying things like that and doing these kinds of crosses without theories and things. So you wanna go outside the discovery to tell these stories, right? Um, lose the chronological cross. Sometimes, and I'm not saying don't ever do it, but don't be afraid to start in the middle and go in the end, right? It depends on what these things are and how they fit within your story to tell it, right? I wanna start with a state left off. That might be a good transition, right? And then go into it. And then, and then you know, let me back up now. When this first story, when you first made this call, you were at home, right? After you, so you want to make sure, right? Don't do the ex-prosecutor's cross. We already talked about that. Organize your chapters to build from least dramatic to the most dramatic. That's within your chapters, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily how in your big framework of cross, right? You, you, it depends, like you may organize your cross, start big, end big, right? It depends on how you do it within your chapters, right? Each chapter builds off the last. There may be several arcs, right? Start simple and end big. Right, start simple and then big. You want to make sure that the juries remember the first words out of your mouth and the last words out of your mouth. Now, going back to this hypothetical, I'm not going to reread it, but I want us to think about uh, how do we make our cross, how do we improve this cross based off emotional themes? How do we build it based off of what was missing before? So let's first ask the simple questions. How do we want the jury to feel about this witness? Let's look at some of the things that she gave us in that fact pattern, right? She says she takes the alley to avoid tourists crowding the walkway and the riders, and the, and the bike riders. That night, middle of the alley, knowledge 
Now, she says, I go here all the time, right? She says, I take the same alley every week, right? She says that. So she has a knowledge of the area. I go to this coffee shop every week. I take the same alley to get there. Born and raised here. Too dark for the witness to see. You have a chapter heading and you have a point. Blinded could not see. Let's look at some other facts. So you're looking at the facts to know what to build up to. You're creating your questions. The gun seemed to get bigger and bigger. It was silver and the handle was black. I couldn't keep my eyes off his finger nuzzling the trigger. The second chapter heading, the witness was focused on the gun, not the person. Overwhelmed. I was sweating because of how bad my nerves were. All I could think about was my six-year-old daughter. Wondered if I would live to see another day. So what's our next point? What's our next chapter heading? Witness was worried about survival. So you have our chapter headings. It was too dark for a witness to see. Witness was focused on the gun, not the person. Witness worried about the survival. We have our emotional themes. Blinded could not see. Overwhelmed. Terrified. Now, did you notice one thing when we talked about your theory? These words were in your theory. These words were in your theory, but you know what they're not? They're not cross questions, right? They're not cross questions. The chapter heading and the themes are not your cross questions. So keep that in mind. So let's look at the chapter and let's see if we can take another stab at it and see how we can maybe make it a little bit more descriptive. In other words, think of drawing a picture rather than as you, as you tell your story. You said you were born and raised in New Orleans, about three blocks away from where this happened. You're familiar with the area. You're familiar with the alley. You're familiar with the streets around the alley. You have been to that alley several times. You know what the alley looks like. The alley is narrow. A coffee shop is just on the other side. There is a main street ahead of the alley. There's a main street behind the alley. The alley between these main streets looks like the letter H. You were in the middle of this alley when you, stopped by the, when you were stopped by the man with the gun. There are no street lights in this alley. There are no businesses within this alley. Only brick walls to your left, only brick walls to your right, a few garbage disposal units along it. You did not have a light on from your phone or anything when you were stopped. It was nighttime at the time you were in this alley. It was dark was the first question. Well, look how it was dark, was broken down, right? You want to draw a picture. Now, some of you may have never been to New Orleans, but I guarantee you that gives you a little bit better picture of where Magazine Street is, right? Now, some of you may say, well, how do I do that? Investigation, seeing the scene. Now, some of you may say, well, I don't have the funds to contract to investigate. I understand. But what you can do is go out to the scene yourself. And you can look at these things and see that. So you have an image. You know it better than her, right? You know it better than her. That way, you're not worried about if she gives you a different answer. Okay, well, what if she does give me a different answer? Well, that's where you invite someone to take pictures, hopefully as an investigator. But if you don't, then maybe a colleague, right? And they're taking the pictures. And if necessary, you can call them on the stand to complete an impeachment if necessary, right? So think about these things. Investigation is important. You can't do this without it. So your character thing, blinded could not see, right? That's the point in drawing this out. So let's look at an example of another chapter. Focus on the gun, not the person. Kind of the question that we alluded to earlier about the gun, right? So on direct, you said the man that stopped you had a gun. The gun was pointed directly at you. By directly at you, it was not at your feet, not at your chest. The gun was in your face. The gun you said seemed to get bigger and bigger as you stood there. That's how you saw that the handle was black. That's how you saw the nose of the gun was chrome. That's how you saw the finger nuzzle in the trigger. That's how you saw that the gloves on the man's hand as he nuzzled that trigger, right? All I did was flush out what she said. So if you want to repeat something, you repeat it in a way that establishes a theme, right? That they were overwhelmed. So that's why I said, if you're going to use words, you want to make sure that you have a reason for them. Those were your words, not mine now, right? Now, I'm not saying you're going to use that tone with it because you're acknowledging that this is a scary time for her. 
Now, I know this may not answer the question that was earlier about the gun, the specific gun. This is in the generic sense, right? But, you know, as far as if you get more specific and that's a real issue, then you want to do some of the investigative stuff we talked about, right? Researching the gun, getting access, following motion. I think you should follow motion to inspect evidence no matter what. If, there's, if you believe that it'd be physical evidence seized. So, overwhelmed. You want to make sure that you are establishing and making your cross more detailed and fleshing them out for that. Witnesses concerned about survival. Keep myself accountable with time. Witnesses concerned about survival. The last chapter that we're going to look at for purposes of this, uh, this, this hypo hypothetical. When you saw the man with the gun that nuzzled the trigger, you froze. In that moment, you didn't notice whether there was traffic on the main street ahead of you. In that moment, you didn't notice whether there was traffic on the main street behind you. Only thing you noticed was your heartbeat beating fast inside of your chest. Your face began to sweat. Your palms begin to sweat. You have a six-year-old little girl. You do not know if you were going to see her again. You did not know if the next blink would be your last. You kept your eye on the finger nuzzling that trigger, hoping you had it tomorrow. Now, terrified. Those facts build towards that. Isn't that much better than asking, you were terrified? Now, I realize that some of you may say, well, she didn't say all of that, but this is where it's okay to ask a question outside the lines because she's gonna look, she's gonna look a little bit awkward if this didn't happen. Maybe she didn't say that, 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 that her face was sweaty, her palms were sweaty. You can kind of assume her heart is beating fast, right? You can assume that that's what happens. If you're sick, you know the conditions of being sick. You're moving slow. You didn't want to get out of bed. You wanted to stay there. You wanted the sheets over you. You wanted to stay and watch TV. You didn't want to go to work. Right? Maybe they didn't say these things, but think about this is, this is, is it not? So these are common sense questions. And, and if they give you other stuff than common sense questions, then they just look crazy. Then the jury is not going to forgive them. The jury is going to be insulted. Like, okay, now that's just stupid. You said that your chest and this, right? You know, she's going to look crazy if she said, I, well, I, I knew I was going to have a tomorrow, <laughs> you know, after she said, I didn't know if I would see my daughter again, right? So you want to make sure it's okay to play within the realm of common sense. Think about it. You or the prosecutors either telling the jury, don't leave your common sense at the door anyway. So why are you, so why are you, don't be afraid to, to, to use that same principle in cross-examination within the framework of establishing a theme within a theory. So. What is the thing, just to kind of summarize this hypothetical, what is the thing, blinded, could not see, overwhelmed, terrified? Remember I told you about the three adjectives that we want our, our, our uh, witness to have? Those would be the three. If, if I were doing my cross in front of you, I would hope that my colleague, my mom, my dad, whoever, would feel that I got this point across. Blinded, could not see, plus terrified, equals your point. Witness was too traumatized to accurately describe the perpetrator. Now, now that I have a point, now we talk about how does it fit within the big framework of credibility. And that is huge, right? That is huge. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about credibility, but one thing that I know that may be popping up, the first time I did this presentation, uh, I kept getting a lot of questions about, um, well, that's great, but what about statements? What about if they said they did it? Right? I, I kept getting that. Um, I kept getting a lot of uh, all this is good and all, but I have this bad statement. This is assuming the statement was not suppressed, right? You lost your motion to suppress, it's coming in evidence. You know, the story stops there, Kenneth. So what do I do now? So I wanted to make sure and address that. Your storytelling techniques are nothing that we said doesn't stop there. In fact, you just do it a different way. Now, remember, I don't know if how many of you have seen this. This is on Netflix. It's still on Netflix as of last weekend, at least, because I don't have anything else to do whenever I'm not doing work, but look at Netflix. So it's still there, and I know it. When They See Us. For those of you that haven't seen When They See Us, I would recommend that you do, but it's a real tearjerker. It's a five-part, I believe, a five-part or six-part series, um, and it's about five young men based in the 90s in New York and about five young men that were accused of raping uh, a white woman running through Central Park. Um, these men were exonerated, and today they're all doing magnificent things on the forefront of criminal justice. 
but they spent a lot of time in jail. All of these men, except one, were treated as a minor and did their time in juvie. One of these guys, because he was 18, went to adult jail. And this movie follows their narratives of what they went through. In this case, these gentlemen made statements. Statements that they did what they were alleged to do, even though there was no physical possibility that corroborated it. So that being said, if you look at, for those of you that are concerned in post-conviction, then you will know that wrongful confessions is one of the top reasons for exonerations, you know, in addition to DNA and MSID, confessions. And in Louisiana in particular, is one of the leading causes. So that being said, you can still storytell. You need to look at that statement in detail. And you notice I didn't call it a confession because just because it may have come in the evidence, confession is conclusory, just like victim is conclusory. You are not a victim, you are a complaining witness until you are convicted, right? And I do not use a confession until it's been convicted. I don't use, I don't like the word confession. It's a statement. And maybe not even that if it was never made. So with that being said, you want to make sure and investigate it the same way you would investigate anything else. It really bothers me when people say, what if they said they did it? Well, how do I know that they actually said it? How do I know that the recorder wrote it down well? It amazes me of that. Like whenever someone, if you have a bunch of people in court and they all raise their hand and say, I didn't do it, right? The case still goes on, right? It's not like the magistrate court judge lets them off and they'll say, okay, they didn't do it. But for some reason, if they said they did do it, we all say case closed. Now we go to the penalty phase. He did it. So why do you, if you don't believe it when they say they didn't do it, why automatically do you believe when they say they did? I don't understand that. The case still should continue the same way, right? So statements are just words to me, right? May, and I excuse, I apologize if I'm being insensitive to anybody um, that this may have impacted personally, but I'm just looking at it from the framework of building a story of innocence. So that being said, the read technique. A lot of people, I don't know if you know of what the read technique is, but that was emphasized in this movie. And I believe, even though it is classified as an outdated police method of interrogation, it is still something that is readily used today. Because if you know what the read technique is, go back and look at some of your statements and I guarantee you will see remnants of it. Now, this is not to criticize all police officers. This is just to show a reality within police officers that does exist and does impact some cases like this if you look a little closer. So this is not a training on a read technique, but I do want to make you a little bit familiar with what it is. It is a psychological method of police interrogation that is illegal. It, it is allowed to be used. And most police officers in their trainings are at the very least exposed to the existence of the read technique. So I would often say, for those of you where this is an issue, try to get a copy of your police manual, whether it's through about open record subpoena requests or whatever the case may be, try. It involves nine steps. And just to kind of give you an idea of some of these steps, direct confrontation with being accused, right? Reinforce sincerity. Hey, look, man, you're gonna get a misdemeanor if you get off. All you gotta do is say you did it. It's a slap on the wrist. Direct confrontation, you did this. We have witnesses here. We know you did it, right? That's direct confrontation. Reinforce sincerity, you know, good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Poses alternative questions, right? Uh, questions that plant what the evidence is. Well, you know, they said that a gun, a black gun was recovered, right? You know where that black gun was, don't you? Right? Lead to repeat. Basically, you know what? We just talked about cross-examination. They use cross-examination more effective than we do at times. You were there. You were not there by yourself. In fact, you had a lot of people with you. You had a black gun. There are, there are better cross-examinations than us sometimes, if you listen to these tapes. Um, lead to repeat admission of guilt, right? Memorialized statement. And I say, now these may not be all the steps, but a lot of times, some of you may be stuck on the fact of, oh, well, they gave detailed questions. Well, that's because the officer, when they were there confronting them, they gave them what the evidence was this entire time. So when they come back and ask them, what was it? Of course, they're going to know what the answer is, because you just sat there and told me that I had a black gun for four hours. So, of course, I'm going to say, well, now, what was the gun again? That's when they're memorializing. That's when they get to the memorializing phase. And they did that with these gentlemen. They did that with these gentlemen. So you want to be aware of the read technique and some of the pitfalls of it, right? Because it can be very dangerous. One of the things you may want to look at is, is a narrative, right? Or are they, is your client giving a narrative of what happened? Are they asking pursuant to questions and how are these questions being asked? How, you know, so you want to be careful about that. So possible chapters that you might want to consider in a case where you have a bad statement. The read technique. You want to know it as well as the officers do. 
you want to know the interrogation room, have an idea of what it looks like. Now, some of this may be a challenging step because you may not have access to it. So some of this, you may be relying on your client a lot of what this room looks like. Um, some of you may have more liberal jurisdictions or come from more liber liberal jurisdictions where you file scene visits. There's been cases where I filed a scene visit for a jail, right? If it's contraband and a contraband was inside of a mattress, I want them to see how close this thing is, what the conditions actually are. Now, of course, this is all pre-COVID kind of stuff, but the fact is, is that the interrogation, you want to have an idea of what it looks like or at least what one looks like, right? You want to talk about how it's confined right? Who, they're confined in a certain space, control, right? The time, right? You want to paint the scene of what this looks like. So this is how you storytell. Maybe a cross may look like this. You know, officer, I want to talk to you about interrogation. You know what that is. You refer to it in your report. You've been there several times. It's the room you use when you talk to someone. And better yet, that someone is what you call a suspect. In that room is a metal table. Metal table is about four by eight. On one side of the table are two chairs. On the other side of the table is one chair. That one chair, usually, that's where the suspect sits. The other two chairs, that's where you sit. That's where you're off. That's where your partner sits. Then the chair across from you Usually there are handcuffs attached to the table and they're attached to the wrist of who you call the suspect. And in this case, my client. I don't use my client, but Mr. So-and-so, I don't like to use my client in crosses, but you know, Mr. Fishpaw. And as Mr. Fishpaw sits there, he can't get up and go to the, he can't get up and go to the door. You can. He can't get up and go to the bathroom without your permission. In there, there is a recorder. He can't get up, Mr. Fishpaw can't get up and press stop. You control that. You control when he gets in, you control when he gets out, right? And then maybe you have another one about, you know, you didn't have water or you didn't have food or whatever the case may be, right? You wanna make sure and establish this environment, this environment of control that puts a person into the fear to say something that they, to say they did something they didn't do. Right? So you can still tell stories. Now, I told you about credibility and that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about how this fits into the big picture of credibility. You have your theory, you have your character themes, now what? Um, and so the now what is this? Now, many of you have many different types of ways of how you, uh, your jury instructions of how you evaluate credibility. So one of the things I would always say is make sure you file a motion for your jury instructions. And I would even say litigate by following special jury instructions to try to get the language you want to use. But for purposes of this, I'm just going to use a generic form of how jurors are instructed uh, to do credibility, if that's okay with y'all. One, usually juries get, um, usually, you know, you want to be specific in credibility, right? Credibility, there are many different prongs of credibility. There's veracity. Is the witness's testimony accurate with the physical evidence beyond, with the facts beyond change? For example, with the New York boys, they weren't. Uh, believability. Does the witness's account make sense within the facts, right? Are they giving you answers that just doesn't make sense? And reliability, does the witness give a consistent, right? How many times were they impeached, right? Usually a witness's testimony is going to fall within those, right? If they are just liars and everything they say is a lie, then maybe it may be veracity and believability you're attacking. If they're mistaken, maybe it, it you know, maybe it's just believability. Maybe it doesn't make sense Re regardless, right? You want to know these elements of credibility because it's important, right? Because whenever you tell the jury in a closing statement, the judge is going to instruct you when you're grading the state's paper, there are certain things you look at before you give them an A. One of the things you look at is whether, how many times did they tell different stories? The judge will call that reliability. Some of them may look at, hey, you know what? It didn't make sense. We actually not to use your common sense and keep it at the door. So they call it believability, right? That's what the judge is gonna call it. And other word is a B word called veracity. This physical evidence that they said they collected, how accurate is what they're saying to that, right? How accurate? And I'm gonna tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Fishball was neither accurate, believable, or reliable. He just needs to be one of these things before you, he, he can't, you know, if, he, if he's not one of these things, you can throw it out the door. He wasn't either, he wasn't none of them, right? So you can really break it down into witnesses rather than just saying they weren't credible. <laughs>
you know, like, okay, they weren't credible, how, right? So you want to make sure and break it down. So in the framework of what we're talking about, you want to create the perfect storm. You want to have the law hold the jury accountable for how to evaluate credibility. You want to have the emotion, the cross-examinations to draw a picture and not conclusion, right? Because maybe when you're organizing your closing statement, you may have veracity, and then you put your points that we establish, right, to your witness under which part of credibility that falls under. So maybe the fact that the witness was traumatized, that falls under reliability. Maybe the fact that they were blinded and could not see, maybe that falls under, you know, veracity, right, or, or whatever the case may be. Right. And so whenever you're saying, let me tell you why she's not credible. Now you're getting to draw on your conclusion. She wasn't, she could not see. She was traumatized. She was blocked. So it's a formula, right? You're taking that cross and you're leading it in to a meaty part of what your closing statement is, if that makes sense. So when storytelling, I like to think of this, uh, this man, Morgan, Morgan Freeman. If you don't know who Morgan Freeman is, uh, you know, you, I don't know how many movies you've seen. Morgan Freeman, along with uh, Samuel L. Jackson, the black guy that's played in just about any movie there is. Either one of them has been in, in, in the movie, one of them. You know, just about every movie that's made since Christ, right? So this man, but one thing about Morgan Freeman is that he is an excellent storyteller. I can listen to this man tell a story all day, right? So now we transition into persuasive skill sets. That's a skill set, right? Now that we know how to tell a story, within the framework of being a lawyer, how do we say, okay, now we got all that. How do we make it appealing? He's a good example of that. So tone matters, right? Tone matters. What do I mean? Loud versus soft. If you're getting to a very emotional part of the story, maybe you're talking a little quiet. Or maybe if they were sitting there interviewing your client without your lawyer present, right, you want them to feel something. So you want to make sure and be able to use that tone variance, not monotone. I'm going to tell you all right now, some of you may not be agreeing with everything I'm saying, but one thing that you can't say is that my tone variance, right, that I'm monotone. I'm everything. I may be something. Some of you may agree. Some of you may disagree. But one thing I'm not is boring, right? And you don't want to come across that way before a jury. Juries are expecting you to be boring. They don't want to be there. They don't care who was charged or what. They don't want to be there. So you want to make it a little less boring. Speed matters, right? Do you want the description to be, do you, if you're accepting the description and they still got it wrong, then maybe you want it to be as slow as possible, right? You stood there and as you stood there, you used the word froze. And in that moment of frozen time, you analyzed their face for 20 seconds. One, two, three, right? That sounds a lot different than you stood there for 20 seconds, right? Sounds a lot different, slow tone. Or maybe you're trying to say it happened so fast, right? That they didn't, that, that, you know, they didn't get a good look. And then now you want to speed up time. You were there, you turned around, your purse was jerked around, right? You're using your tone to mimic time. Fast versus slow, sorry about that. Fast versus slow, that's an important, Variation of persuasive technique. Consider your theory of case, right? Word choice. Consider the theme of your witness, but your words versus the witness's words, right? Um, there may be a time to use witnesses' words, right? If you're trying to emphasize a point, like I did in the cross before. You know, your six year old daughter, you didn't know if you were going to see them again, you know, or, or whatever the case may be, right? You, you said that. That was your words, ma'am, or your words, sir. Right. You want to make sure and emphasize that if that's something they use, especially if it's a derogatory statement and you're trying to paint this witness in a certain kind of light. Those are your words, sir. And, excuse, you know, even if it's something that you're not comfortable with, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to excuse me for what I'm about to say. But he was this. Those were your words. Right. Now, if you do something like that, make sure you have a locked in source, especially if it's some type of derogatory statement. You want to be careful about that, especially, you know, the, in, a, in, in the world that we live in, you want to be very, very comfortable, uh, careful about that. So your words versus the witness words. Uh, you want to know when to use that. Even how you name your witnesses is very important. So I want to give a little example of what I mean by that. Remember I told you your characters in your story. For those of you that don't know Gideon's Promise, this is the founder, John Rappian. 
Um, he's a very prominent person. You're going to see a lot of him because he has a book that's, that's coming out. Um, and uh, very, very magnificent teacher. Very, very uh, instrumental in this field of client-centered representation that we try to live up to. Uh, but I'm just using him as an example because he would be really pissed if I used this. But to go ahead and tell him because I want him to know. So um, John Rapping is the lead detective in your Orm Robbery case. So when you think of it this nature, what are you going to call him? Will he be Officer John Rapping? If he's Officer John Rapping, then maybe he looks like this, right? That's the word pick. That's, that's, that's how people see him. In other words, he did everything by the book. So if the complaining witness were telling the truth, he'd be testifying consistent with the investigation. This is where you're attacking the complaining witness. The officer is not a bad part of our story. He does not really anything in our story. He's just another validating source that credits the report because the witness is lying. Will he be a cop? If he's a cop, maybe this is the image of him, right? Maybe this is the image of the cop. Did not bother to take fingerprints, statements, didn't collect evidence, DNA. This is where you're shouting out in your closing statements. I wish he did take DNA. I wish he did take evidence because if he did, then the wrong man, then, then the right man would be sitting here, not Mr. Fishpaw, right? So you want to make sure and, 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 and title how you want to call them from your opening statement on. Or maybe he doesn't even have a name. Maybe he's just rapping and he looks like that, right? Training day. This is the guy that planted drugs, coerced confessions, multi created inconsistencies, right? So you want to be very, very close about how you carry. Be careful about how you carry, how you label your witnesses. Also consider your theme, right? Um, be authentic. Be authentic, right? Um, I used this in the last slide, and, I, and I'm carrying over because it's the same thing. When we're talking about values in relation to clients, be authentic, right? Um, and I use this mainly, be yourself. Use words you would use and that you're comfortable using. Right, unless you're trying to emphasize something. In other words, with officers, whenever if the officer is a bad part of your story, they're a negative character of your story, protagonist, I'm, uh, an antagonist. I'm sorry. Then, why are you using their words? Do you realize when you use their words, you're subconsciously reinforcing the validity of their report? Do you realize that there are studies, psychological studies, that show when you use someone's word, you are subconsciously validating. Did the officer canvas or did he look around? Whenever y'all used to go to, about, to, to happy hours before COVID and you would talk about your case, like we talked about, did you say that? Man, the officer, he didn't do anything when he canvassed the scene. You don't talk like that. I mean, if you do, forgive me, but you don't talk like that. So why are you doing that in front of a jury, right? Did the officer observe or did he see? You don't observe things around, you look. You see, you look around, right? So why are you using this? Don't talk like them. Be authentic and reinforce everything with the government witness. Uh, even when a particular, you don't, whenever you're reinforcing themes, it doesn't have to be that particular witness. You can use other witnesses to do it. This next thing was a clip, but um, unfortunately with this clip, uh, you, you probably won't be able to hear it because of the last clip. So I'm just gonna briefly describe it. This is Mark Furman in the OJ trial. And if you notice one thing that Johnny Cochran did beautifully, and I say Johnny Cochran, I know that in my bio, you heard Kappa Alpha Psi, it's a fraternity. Johnny Cochran was a Kappa as well, so I have, to, I have to acknowledge that. But nonetheless, he used the consistent theme with the witness, right? You may not be able to hear it, but this is not Mark Furman, obviously. This is another detective. And Johnny Cochran is saying, he's using the term, it was Mark Furman who led you to this house. It was Mark Furman that led you to the gloves. It was Mark Furman that led you to this conclusion that these gloves belong to the owner of the house or whatever the case may be, right? And that's what he was doing. This is basically a short, uh, is a short synopsis of showing how he's using another witness to create, and he was, and even more beautifully, he's using this tone to create that theme. It was Mark Furman, right? Because he already established that Mark Furman had said the N word and who he was. He already had got that out through Mark Furman. So, now everything is centered on Mark Furman's control of the investigation. And he's using that now through other detectives. It was Mark Furman who directed you to do this. Mark Furman who directed you to do that, which is completely not necessary for the case, right? So you can still use other witnesses to, to carry the theme about another witness. So be creative in how you do that. So I did, I did say that we would have at least 10 minutes. Well, not, I didn't commit to a time, but some time for questions. So just as a simple recap, uh, of storytelling through cross-examination. Don't neglect cross-examination techniques, which I call one-on-one -on -one techniques. Um, and that's the leading questions, one fact per question, advancing theory, 
establish a theme for each witness. And when I think of theme, those three adjectives that you want to come away with that ultimately form the point that you're going to carry within an assessment of credibility and be mindful of how you establish their character theme, right? Your tone, your speed, your authenticity, right? You want to make sure that you are relaying it in a way that gives it validity of capital of, of making sure to emphasize your client's story and narrative of innocence. Um, there are many different ways uh, to do this, uh, but this is one suggested way. And I encourage you to seek trial colleges, reach out to folks, reach out to me. Uh, I'll be happy to do that. I will say before you ask any questions, my email uh, is kenneth.harden at pdo.htx.net. So that's k-e-n-n-e-t-h dot h-a-r-d-i-n at p-d-o dot h-c-t-x dot net. I know it's long, but most of these word generated emails are. So uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may not be, want to ask right now or later on down the line. And yes, I did graduate at LSU. And given that there may not be a football season, I want to remind you who the champs will be again if we don't have a college football season. So with that, thank you. All right, Kenneth, um, we do have uh, at least one question in the chat so far. But before we go to that, um, was Drew Brees, did he go to LSU? I'm sorry? Did you, Drew Brees go to LSU and then go on and play for the Saints, or did he go to a different school? I, um, I, I will say that uh, maybe I'll plead the fifth. Okay. Uh, but I will say rumors. There are rumors that he attended Purdue University. There are rumors that he's from Austin, Texas. Uh, there are rumors about that. I've heard those rumors. Okay. But at this, I can neither confirm nor deny that he attended Louisiana State University. Okay. All right. Well, that's the answer to my question. Thank you. Um, so Corey asked a question, how do you deal with knowing better than the witness, but not testifying? I think she asked this question when you were um, talking about the three adjectives that you wanted to get from your witness. And that was the um, knowing the area. I think that's when she asked the question. So how do I get out of, I want to make sure I understand the question. How do I get out of the witness when I know more than them? How do you deal with knowing better than the witness, but not testifying? Like, well, I think- what, Oh, not when testifying on behalf of the witness. Oh, okay. Right, right, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, um, it, it's a tough, slippery slope because some judges just whenever you're using leading questions are going to be like, you're testifying for the witness. And a lot of times, by the way, if they do that, just from how you're asking the question, then go ahead and add an inflection at the end of your tone. You were there, I think? You know, I don't like that, but usually use that and then still stick with the form. You were there at night? You know, it's still a leading question where they're saying, were you there at night? You know, so I would still say that and hopefully you won't get that objection or a judge is stopping you as much, right? Because, you know, you, you have that, you, you, you have that, to, you have that flexibility to use that type of questioning and even despite what judges feel about it. But to your question, knowing more than the witness, I think that, it depends on how you're characterizing your witness. If you're saying that, if your witness says that they were there all the time and that they would, that, that, that they take this alley like the hypo did, then at this point, what you're doing is you're validating that they know about it to create how dark it was, right? That they're going to, basically, if you know more than the witness, it's a psychological way of kind of more or less saying, look, I know this alley. Basically, I know it too, right? I know this and that and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And so you're also establishing a sense of control over that witness to where you're letting them know that you know this scene, right? You know this scene, we've been out there without saying we've been out there. So in some ways you are depending upon that. That is true, it is a little bit risky. You are depending upon that. But if they don't know it, and that's something that either way is an advantage. Let's say that's a major point, right? Maybe they're so inaccurate that goes to their lack of veracity with incredibility. They're not accurate with the physical evidence. If they don't know it, then that makes their witness questionable as far as those things, right? You know, if they don't know it, then, you know, if they've been there every day, then they should know it. Now you do because you have your pictures from your investigation to show all these cross questions. The point is, is that it's more important that you know it and that you have a source now for impeachment one way or the other. Either you have it and you want impeachment and that witness is locked in that control or you have it for impeachment because you know what impeachment obviously the steps are 
right? You're committing the witness to the inconsist to the to the inconsistency, right? You're establishing the credit the you're accrediting them, right? And then you're confronting them. And in this case, you're completing the impeachment with another witness, which would this be the person who took the pictures with you when you went to the scene to show these pictures that is more than what the witness knows. Hopefully that tells a little bit more of your fleshes out a little bit more of your question. Yeah, I, I think I think that answered her question, at least the way that I interpret the question. Um, oh yeah, she said, thank you, that was great. Um, I, I actually had a question that is not exactly related to storytelling through cross-examination, but I was sure. taking some notes on my computer when you were talking. <clears throat> you mentioned in the beginning that um, 80 to 90% of the jurors determine how they feel about your case after opening. Um, so I just wanted to get your opinion. Um, you, you specifically said determine how they feel about the case after opening. Do you think that your trial is won or lost at the opening? I think it, it can be. Now, I want to make sure and make one thing clear about 80 to 90 percent. Their first verdict, I believe they come to their first verdict at the conclusion of opening. Uh, subject to change because they may after the first witness on direct they may feel another way and then after cross so if they make in their first conclusions on opening statements take advantage of that there are jurisdictions just to give you a little bit more space around that there are certain jurisdictions where a lot of people waive opening um the the county that i'm in it happens frequently in new orleans in orleans parish we never waived openings not just the public defenders Private defense attorneys, no matter how you were trained, no matter where you came from, nobody ever waived open. In Harris County in Houston, they waive them just as much as they do not waive them. And this really has to do with how defenses are charged. Um, they're charged as extraneous in, in, in Harris, so you can open the door. There's a greater risk of opening the door in Houston as it is in New Orleans, where they charge everything at once. By you know, So it's really kind of that difference that plays out. But I am one that you never lose an opportunity it, it, I said that statement to, to show that I am I fall on the camp that you you always you never wave open. I, I, that's how I believe. And secondly, under that fact, given that as your first chance, you are advancing your theory. Now in jury selection, you're planting seeds of your, your your theory a little bit as you're developing your questions. Even though you know that's more of an eight, you know, more of your they're talking more than you. Uh, but you are advancing your theory as a conclusive unit for the first time. And it's very important in your opening. Okay. So that's what I mean as far as taking advantage of that opportunity. Sorry. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what I'm asking this because this has actually happened to me. What if your theory or your th or whatever word you want to use for purposes of my question, what if your theory changes throughout the course of the trial? I had my first actually felony jury trial. It was supposed to be um, the, the legal aspect of the theory was self-defense. That changed because of things that witnesses said and didn't say and my client um, not taking the stand when we planned on him taking the stand and my opening was all about um, self-defense. And um, and I just, I just had to completely shift gears. So, you know, I, I don't, I, I ended up, we ended up winning the trial, but you know, how, how important is it to, um, you know, make sure that doesn't happen or, or does that happen frequently and you just have to roll with it and, and your theory changes? I mean, do you, do you understand kind of where I'm getting at? I understand at? what you're saying. I think, I think one way to prevent it is not overcommit the opening is what I call soft openings. Um, now I'm not saying you get up there and saying the state won't prove the state won't prove. But you're being very careful. Usually whenever I'm doing an opening, I think of three major points that I want to improve within that. And I believe in an opening, there is a structure to an opening. You have a narrative of innocence. You have a narrative, which is usually in present tense form. You have a, what the state did not show you. And you have your jury empowerment and you have your conclusion. So whenever you're talking about that portion of what the state did not show you, I usually pick three things, three safe things. Right, three safe things that I've established that even the state may conclude as a fact beyond change. I don't get over detail because then that's where you can get into a situation. If you don't know what a witness is going to say, sometimes I may say, you know, um, if you don't know what a, sometimes you, you want to make sure and know have a have a, a plan for that witness. 
Maybe as a witness that you don't know they're going to testify, but you hope they do because you have a lot of impeachment sources. I'll say, look, you know, the state, the state going to tell you that their whole case rests on a complaining witness. And there's a witness out there. And I hope they put them on the stand. I hope they do. I hope they do. We couldn't find them. So I hope they do. You know, something like that, you may say, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen, right? So to something like that where you don't know, you want to maybe lead in that direction. But you want to be careful not to overcommit to that. Um, because don't get me wrong, I'm not saying if a theory changes in the case, you'll lose it. But going into a case with a shakable theory or a theory subject to change or overcommitting to where you're going into the unknown is like going for a 10 mile run with a 70% chance of rain. Maybe, yeah. the, maybe it doesn't rain, right? And you still win, right? You, you, you run and you run, your 10 mile run is fine but it's a 70% chance of rain, right? <laughs> so you, you, you wanna be very, very careful about that because unfortunately, I do believe that jurors psychologically hold the defense to a burden as opposed to the state. And so with that being said, I think one way to do it is not to overcommit. You wanna look at your things after you have your theory, what are the three facts that we wanna get out about it, right? Because all your, three, all your theory is, is it's, it's, a, it's a narrative of innocence, right? It's a narrative of innocence or towards a response of a lesser verdict or whatever case you may be trying to get, right? That's really all it is. And you want to make sure that you're not overcommitting to that because that's when those problems happen, you know? Now, if it, if it becomes a situation where it's an evidential issue, where there's something that you relied on or, or something that the state got wrong, then that's where you want to make sure and have the jury excuse and litigate it because you may have created a legal defect and a legal defect is subject to a mistrial. So, if it's to the to that point, then then that's that's beyond a theory discussion. So mm -hmm. that's that probably may be the first question you need to ask. Does this is this change of theory created by a legal defect that they created? Mm -hmm. Right? That's mm -hmm. subject to a mistrial. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that yeah. answers a little bit. Yeah, it did. And and that's a good point. And uh, I mean it could have been and probably was highly influenced by the fact that it was my first jury trial. But um, I, I'm sure a lot of us and, and the participants on this call have been in situations um, where something has happened that we weren't expecting to our benefit or to our detriment. And uh, maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit how to deal with that situation if it comes up, you know, not necessarily with cross-examination, but just based on your trial experience. The situation, can you actually, I want to make sure I understand the situation if so just something coming up in trial that you weren't oh. expecting, um, whether it's to your benefit or to your detriment, because I'm sure it's happened to all of us, you know, on, on varying scales of how much it affected the case. But um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's experienced that. So, you know, what would you suggest oh. is the best way to deal with that? I don't know if you uh, want to comment. One of the ways, up, but I, <laughs> I think that's going to always happen in every phase of trial is that that there's always gonna be something expected. Some of the very unexpected that happens, um, or it wouldn't be called trial. <laughs> uh, one of the things is, is um, make sure, this, this is very basic, make sure you have a co-counsel with you uh, at all times. Don't try to be the hero and try by yourself. You may, be, you may be a fantastic attorney and you may have practiced 20 something years, but it's good to have a fresh pair of eyes, right? And picking a jury and being eyes and ears and seeing things that you can't necessarily see. A second thing uh, I would say to prohibit it, to, to try to, uh, to, to adjust is active listening when a witness is on the stand. That's one of the biggest failures to people not being able to adjust. They're so focused on their cross and the next question, or they're, so fo they're not listening to direct and they're trying to get their points across. You want to make sure and have active listening and being able to respond to what they're saying, right? Uh, and being able to address things that are left on the table or you know, not to impeach when they've already gave you the answer that you're looking for. So active listening usually is something that gets you into that lack of active listening gets you into that territory. Also, sound techniques limited the limits the unexpected. Not asking most people some 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 cross there are some people who are fantastic, maybe even book writers and scholars that will tell you, oh, open ended questions are okay. No, they're not. And that, that, leads to, that leads directly to this unexpected area that you're talking about. When you're asking open-ended, you're opening up a window of explanations that that witness can go on and on and on and on and on and on about, stuff that you're not prepared and locked in on, right? Um, if, if you are asking, you know, 
there, there was I, I, in doing supervision. I remember with with we, I was I was helping a young attorney prepare for trial, and we spent about four hours on whether to ask open ended one open ended question, and we ultimately came to the conclusion that in that scenario was okay. But we spent four hours digesting the scenarios and why and the point of it. Four hours, right? So you want to really put a lot of thought. I'm not saying I, I mean open ended questions. There may be some situations. But it has to be an intentional strategy for something like that. So it's really, there's nothing you do that's going to be to erase all of the unexpected, but there are things you can take. Uh, and that's that a sound technique, a fully developed, thoughtful theory, right? And active listening. And also pre-trying the hell out of a case. You want to make sure in pre-trial as many, is many issues as you can to narrow it down. If, there, if you're missing discovery and you believe that discovery is favorable, start to create a missing evidence instruction. If you have inculpatory evidence that they violated discovery, then you want to make sure and file a motion to exclude based on them not giving you discovery timely that's going to negatively prejudice your ability to give a defense. If you know that there's information that's more prejudicial than probative, then you want to attack that now. And these are the rules of the game. They can't mention this. They can't mention that. If you know something is going to be admissible hearsay because they couldn't get their witnesses based off of their subpoena witness list, then you want to exclude their testimony up front. So pre-trying litigation would also be the fourth way to maximize the evidence block, everything that they can, so you know the rules of the game and you can fair end it to where it, you, you can limit that, that wall. Of, of things that get in that are in the unexpected draft. So those would be the four things I would say that you can do to at least limit it from happening, because that's all we can really do with the trial is limit it. I don't think you'll com ever completely eliminate it. So I started getting into evidence and that's a whole other presentation. I apologize. I think you're sorry, still- I, Sorry, I muted myself when you were talking because I was typing. Um, it could be a whole other presentation, but a lot, of, I mean, a lot of this stuff kind of goes hand in hand, so you have to touch on it together. Yeah. Um, if anybody else has questions, um, I think uh, what I'm going to do is unmute everybody. So if you want to actually ask a question, you can, or at least I'm going to allow you the ability to unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, we're, six, we're six minutes over, but I'll stick around. And, and if y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. That's fine. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to. Oh, Zoom, come on. One person I'm trying to unmute and it's not let me. Well, either way, um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them here or um, just raise your hand, um, metaphorically speaking, if you want to ask a question. Um, I'm, I know people are dropping off because we have gone over an hour and a half, but um, Kenneth is a wealth of knowledge, so take advantage of the time now. I'm just looking back to see if I had any other unanswered questions. The reason why our, our presentation went so late a couple weeks ago was because um, I, I just kept getting, I, I, I just kept thinking more and more questions I wanted to ask Kenneth because I was learning so much. All right, I'm looking at my Thank notes. Thank you, I, I really appreciate it. I think we all learn from each other and it's, it's practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can't wait for the day that I can go to Prince William County and see some of y'all and learn from y'all um, and, and, and see how things are going on. I wish that we were doing this in person, you know, so I'm sure there's much we can learn both ways. Yeah, um, it's nice that we have the technology to be able to do these things, but yeah, I, I can't wait till we can start comfortably, safely doing things in person. Um, you and me both. But, I actually did want to ask you a question. If you could tell us about um, Gideon's promise, before, and then I'll yes. probably be the last question. Last question, unless anyone else has anything. Yes, um, Gideon's Promise is a public defender organization that has a mission on developing public defender offices, especially those that aren't necessarily funded. Uh, there are mentorship and and different opportunities that people go to Gideon's Promise, even if they're not part of a public defender's office. Um, like, for example, in Harris County, they had a listserv of court-appointed attorneys that applied to go into Gideon's because they created a grant for those. There are, there are people that attend Gideon's Promise within that. If you're saying, well, I'm not a public defender, I'm a court-appointed, or, you know, that their opportunities still go. Um, it's a program that is meant to develop you and expose you to some of the things we're talking about as making you a client centered attorney. Yes, we do go, we do cover trial skills all the way from uh, jury selection to closing statement and in, in between. 
Uh, but we also mm-hmm. talk about plea bargains. We talk about client relationships. We talk about uh, evidence. We talk about every aspect of becoming a well-rounded attorney. And really, it's a three-year committed program if you go into the program. The first, uh, the, the three years, and they meet every fall and every winter. Um, in the fall, by, it's August, and then in, Janu- in January in the winter. Um, throughout this three years, you're meeting for a weekend, with the exception of the very first meeting. Whenever you get accepted in, in that fall, you have to commit to two weeks of training. Two weeks of training. And then for the remainder of the three years, as you alternate as a weekend, and we focus in on more advanced topics going forward. Uh, but more importantly, other than the knowledge, is a, is a community of support. Look, we all go through different things. We all have war stories, and these wounds sticks to our ribs because we have so many different things that we battle every day. And public defenders are a selfless and thankless job, and we need that support. And so that is really what the goal of public defender. That's what it does. It, you, it, it does develop you, but it, it, it helps. Uh, Virginia is also included within the last few years. Uh, but even it doesn't end at developing attorneys. We also have a program called Trainer Development, where we train leaders and supervisors and chiefs, and we start to develop you and give you tools because that's a separate set of training, right? And then we also have graduate programs where you can start to train to be presenters and you can be trained to be a mentor. Some of you may say, look, I don't want to do all that. I just want to stay plugged in. I just want to mentor people. You can do that as well. So we're getting bigger. And I'm saying now as a board of director, I'm a, I'm a faculty member, but I'm also a board of director. And so there are many different ways and aspects for you to have a role within Gideon's Promise. I highly recommend it. I've done other programs, NCDC, and all these programs are great. Um, they're all great. Uh, but Gideon's Promise to me is really among some of the, is one of the premier uh, of that, and they're growing. And so if those of you ever want to look it up, look it up. Gideon's Promise is great. Um, Without it, I don't think I would be where I would be emotionally or uh, professionally. So it's, it's a very, very good program. It's not a buy in the Kool-Aid or some type of, uh, you know, I mean, there may be criticisms that it's some type of cult or whatever the case may be. It's funny how people always label commitment a cult. It's not. It's not any of that, y'all. It's, it's something that develops you to be a well-rounded, client-centered attorney. And, um, and, and there's a place for everybody in getting it from. So uh, I hope to see some of y'all there. Well, thank you so much for telling us about it. Um, I mean, I knew a little bit about it, but that actually gave me um, some more information and a different perspective. Are they meeting this year in person or are they meeting online? We, we would normally be meeting now, uh, uh, August. Uh, we would be in the middle of our first of our, of our yearly class. So we're not meeting virtually either because some of the public defenders offices are just really under fire with everything going on with COVID, but we are hosting trainings. Um, and some of us are giving different various types of trainings and, um, and giving them Zoom links. We also have happy hours that we meet every, every, you know, like every other Friday or so uh, as check-ins. We have mentors. We make sure that our mentors are checking in with their assigned mentees. And so we're not meeting formally within the scope of the program, but we are meeting informally and trying to substitute as much as we can for what we would normally do. Um, and so our attention is really drawn on uh, the next program, whether that be January or unfortunately the next August uh, mm-hmm. at this point in time. But one thing I will say, y'all, is where, regardless of whatever you're in, look at it. I've done all the programs. I've done the mentorship program. I've done the trainer to trainer develop program. And, and I've done what they call the core 101 program. The core 101 program is the two week, three year, within three year program. Um, but some of you are on different levels. And so uh, there, I've done them all, I've done all those programs. And I can say that they're all unique in a different way. All had different challenges uh, and different goals. So plug in, the website is active, um, you know, and and you will see that and you will hear from other stories of people, uh, even clients, former clients that that are tuning in to Gideon's Promise. So it's it's a big thing. We've lately been hosting webinars too. I did a webinar with Gideon's Promise about two months ago. So if you look at my Facebook page, I believe it's posted somewhere on my Facebook page along with other stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a phenomenal organization, y'all. It really is. If, if it's not, call me up, curse me out, whatever it is you want to do, I'll, I'll take it. Well, uh, it, it sounds like a good organization. And frankly, Kenneth, I'm going to contact you offline here about how I can be involved because um, sure. I, uh, Every time I hear about this really great opportunity, I think to myself, why didn't I pursue that before? But, you know, we're all busy. So um, 
Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and all of the information. I know that you are a very busy person with work and everything that you do um, to help the community and everybody. So thank you very much for your time uh, for doing well, this presentation you. twice, actually. I got a lot out of it and I know everybody else did. And I don't know if you noticed, but there were a lot of um, comments saying great presentation and thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so, so much. Thank y'all so much. I don't, I don't expect any thank yous. I just want y'all to be the best that you can be. We got to support each other. And now y'all have another friend in Houston that will happily support y'all. Uh, we got to do this together, y'all, because it's a hard job and people's lives are at stake, but we got to love on each other. And, and, and one of the best ways we can share that is by sharing our knowledge. So call me a friend and ally in this battle. Yes, well, thank you very much, Kenneth. And everybody um, should reach out to Kenneth um, if you have any questions because he's a wealth of knowledge. This video is going to be online. Um, so if you are watching this later, um, still feel free to leave a, um, a remark or a question in the comments, or we'll also put Kenneth's and my email address in there so you can contact either one of us. Um, so again, Kenneth, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and um, have a good weekend and hopefully I'll work with you again soon. Yes, I look forward to it. Have a good weekend, everybody. All right, thanks.